Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 462, Pheochromocytoma. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moffin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. One of the most interesting yet scary things for me as I learn more and more about the practice of medicine, because I am not medical at all, I'm psychological, uh, is how doctors diagnose things, and especially not ordinary things. I mean, I always had the image that a doctor goes and sits in their office and people show up and say, I have a fever, I have a cough, I have the flu, I have this or that. And there's probably 40 common things that most people have and most people present with, and that's what they see all day. And, and they treat that. They know what to do. And it's automatic and reflexive and memorized. Mm -hmm. However, sometimes it's not. And so then you get a cluster of symptom presentations that they listen to and they go through their mental checklist and they try the normal things that fall into those clusters. And they say, well, it's probably this. They check it out and it's not that. And they say, well, it's probably this. And they go to the second or third or fourth line. And then they get perturbed and concerned. And they say, well, I'm not real sure what it is. Let's go through it more carefully and let's, let me do some research. Good doctors do. And if they find out what it is or what they think it is, then it's important, if it's not something that they're familiar with, that they make an appropriate referral. So part of the art form of diagnosis is to get out of your habituation, out of your reflex response, out of your mainstream categorization of what most people present with, what most people have. Because sometimes you get presented with something that is rare and maybe deadly. An example of that is what we are calling, or what is called, pheochromocytomia. Uh, it, it's a very rare disease. It can be fatal. It is often diagnosed correctly post-mortem. After death. After death. So, yeah, I'm learning these medical terms. Yes. Uh, so let's look at the cluster of symptoms that, that people who have this present with, and we'll recognize as we go through it how common these symptoms are and how many other things they can be symptoms of. So a doctor who's on top of it has to hear this and go through all these checklists to say, uh, rule out, R-O, R rule out this, rule out that, rule out the other. What are we left with? Heck, I don't know what that is. Where can I find out? In medical school, they always said, if you're hearing hoof beats, it's, <laughs> it's probably a horse and not a zebra. But you always have to consider that it might there may be. be a zebra. Well, so like, that was what we learned, like, first year. <laughs> in in politics, Bill Clinton always said, if you, if you find a turtle on a fence post, you'd be pretty sure it didn't get there by himself. <laughs> So the symptoms are weight loss, nausea and vomiting, shortness of breath, seizures, problems sleeping, headaches, heart palpitations, sweating, high blood pressure, abdominal chest pain, irritability and nervousness, pallor. I mean, that's a cluster. Pallor is, is being really looking pale, white, white and pale. Mm-hmm. Like, like you just saw a ghost. I see that, or I think I see that mm -hmm. as a non-physician, and I think walking heart attack. Right, and 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 they, but that's a gray. Okay. <laughs> People look so a little you, yeah. a little gray, and that's a walking heart attack. But but these folks look like they haven't been out in the sun in years, and they may not have been out in the sun for a while because the sun actually, in their eyes, actually makes them have a headache. It's like having a migraine. It, it triggers it. So they may see, not have been out in the sun. See, I go to dinner with you or with your daughter, who's a physician <laughs> as well, or my son, who is an emergency room nurse, and we're sitting in the restaurant. You're surrounded. And people walk by, and everybody's coming up with, that guy's got this problem, that guy's got that problem, that one over there needs this. And I'm like, what in the heck are you doing? We're having dinner. You know? Yeah, look. well, most of my exam to begin with when I'm talking to someone is, 
I, I, I feel the warmth or coldness of their hands right. to see if they're vasoconstricted or if they, if they have a low thyroid or if they have Renaud's disease. And then I sit down and I look at them. Are they swollen? Do they have, do they have uh, swollen fingers? Do they have uh, rashes? You right. know, that kind of thing. Looking at somebody is half of it. Look, yes, the visual observation, then you do the lab test, and then you talk to them or interview them. If you, mm -hmm. if you have that or physical exam. If they present themselves in mm -hmm. your office. But if you're just sitting in a large restaurant full of people, you know statistically four people in here are going to have a heart attack in the next six weeks mm -hmm. or six months. And you start looking around going, could be that one, could be that one, could be that or one. Or at the gym. Gym, it's really obvious. And, and you've said you've walked into the, like the woman's restroom, and, and, and you've seen a couple <laughs> people in there. And it's really hard for you to not go and approach them and say, Please go to your doctor. Please ask them about the fact that, you know. Right. They have a big goiter. Yeah. You know, that looks like their thyroid is popping out of their neck. But but you are supposed to do that. I don't do that. And, but unless you want they to. ask me something. Unless they ask you, like, yeah, like we all ask strangers, hey, do you see this tick on my neck? <laughs> uh, but, but, but in this case, yeah. in this case, this diagnosis is hard because it's, it is so rare that I've seen it now twice in my years of practice, 30 nine years now since residency or since the beginning of residency. So, I, so I've so i seen it twice, once remotely a long time ago and, and once recently. So I here's how this, this gentleman presented. He presented with the worst headache of his life, which is usually how people destri describe a stroke, and high blood pressure. So he went to the ER. They gave him something for his blood pressure. And they gave him something for pain, and they sent him home. So... They didn't really test him too much because he was young. He was only he's only thirty nine, so they they kind of said, "Ah, oh, young guy, he looks pretty healthy. He's okay." Well, then he had that headache for two weeks before he contacted me, and then when he contacted me, he looked different. He looked physically different than he usually does. He looked like he'd lost weight. He looked he looked bent over. He looked like he was in pain, and he said his whole body was in pain and his muscles felt like they were like they were dying. They were shrinking fast, so fast that he could see them day to day. And he and his he started he so was like his sweating. Body was atrophying? Yeah. Everything was atrophying in his in his muscle mass. I mean he looked like his skin was hanging off of him already too. He weeks. was sweating but he wasn't exercising. No. He was sweating just for no reason at all. And then he was he also had um insomnia from anxiety. He had a he was very anxious at, at night. He he woke up I, d I did blood tests on him, and I did a blood test for metanephrine, which is norepinephrine. And when I did that, I thought, oh, it's probably a wasted test. This is the test for a pheochromocytoma. And just recently, this test has been accepted as a good test to diagnose a pheo because they used to make you do a 24-hour urine, which he ended up having to do as well. But the blood test showed that that he was 10 times normal. And because of that, his blood sugar was up. I mean, that's what happens. This metanephrines are just like you had an overdose of cocaine or an overdose of uh, diet pills. It constricts all your blood vessels. It makes your blood pressure go up. It so gives you is that part of your checklist when you're examining him or interviewing yeah. him? You know, have you been doing any drugs? Uh, oh, yeah. Because this could be a rea reaction, right. any cocaine. Right. No, I mean, that's... Even though that you was at the very know this person, you think that's at probably the very not, beginning. but you have to check. You never know. Yeah. That was the very beginning is what are you taking? What are your supplements? What are, you know, and there was nothing. Yeah. And he, I had tested him the year before for low testosterone. He didn't have it. So I just said, eh, nothing I can do for you. Right. Everything else was normal a year, a year ago. Right. But he didn't have these symptoms, and I did not check metanephrines at that time. It's an unusual test. So I did this test, and I waited three days. All the time, he's getting worse. And he's calling me going, I can't stand it. I'm, I feel like I'm going to die. I feel depressed. I mean, he had that feeling of doom, mm -hmm. and, which is another symptom of this because that's what happens when you have these high epinephrine. So he, so I finally got the test. It was three times normal. His metanephrines were. It fit the whole diagnosis of what I thought he had, which was a pheo. And then I called different doctors and I got him in myself because I was afraid he'd call someplace and they'd say, see you in two months and he might die. So I, so I called and I said- It happen that quickly. Yeah. It was, it was rapidly getting worse. So right. it was at, rapidly growing. So a pheochromocytoma is a mass or a growth 
on your adrenal gland, which sits on top of your kidneys, both kidneys. And it's usually non-cancerous. It's, yeah, only 10% are cancerous. Okay. So, but it can still kill you from... I mean, every time somebody says growth, I think it's the first thing I think. Right. It's a, a growth is not always cancer. Cancer, to me, <laughs> means that it can spread and it, it can uh, put little implants everywhere and, and it can kill you. Yeah. Well, this can kill you in a different way. Right. So uh, we got him to a very nice and endocrinologist who got him in right away at a wonderful staff and 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 he, this gentleman young gentleman liked him which is unusual for him and doctors so he had so that means he did what he said he put him on a different blood pressure medicine and he did two other tests he localized this to find out where is it so if it's in your adrenals you want to have it on only one of them and not the other because if, if you, if you need, can, <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to have to lose both adrenals. Sometimes the surgery causes you to lose both adrenal or a an adrenal. Well, it's one mass on one adrenal, and they didn't see anything anywhere else. So that's really good. And so he is. So so usually they can just remove the mass and not take the adrenal in. Right. Okay. And they usually try to do it through a laparoscopic kind of procedure, mm -hmm. which is great because then you don't have as much recovery. He, he's this guy's a weightlifter. This guy's a health nut. He's very active. He's very, very physically active fit. and physically fit. And at least this, before this before happened. Before this happened, he was he was like an awesome specimen of a guy. Yeah. And this has really hit him hard because of that. Mm -hmm. And probably why it made it so much easier for me to diagnose because it was such a change from the man that I had seen before. Yeah, I mean this guy his history of skydiving, bike riding, hunt, hunting, and, lifting weights. Yeah, and, you in, know, in great he, shape. Yeah. And he, he's out of breath now. This All these symptoms that they that uh, Brett read, he has, and he's just miserable. So the good news is the endocrinologist put him on a drug. I have to tell this, though. The first drug he put him on, he had no idea. But when Tony called the pharmacy, they said that will be $16,000 for one bottle of pills. And Tony goes, I don't have $16,000. I mean, where am I supposed to find that? And, and that's true. Right. Most... 99% of the population can't just find $16,000. Right, right. And he doesn't use credit cards or any of that stuff, so he doesn't live on debt. So he has to find his, his medication or his, his drugs so, for medication. So this is a bottle of pills in, and it's for like 10 days? A 10 day it's, all, it's really only for 10 days. And what it does is it calms your body down so that it doesn't react to this epinephrine anymore. Okay, so it lowers your blood pressure a lot. It makes you really tired. It does a lot of other things that would make it impossible to live on this drug, but it calms everything down. So you just said something that I'm not sure you laid the foundation for. Uh, the the growth on the adrenal gland causes the adrenal gland to pump out epinephrine. Epinephrine. Excess amounts of epinephrine. Which is why Which is an why epinephrine, the blood pressure, the headaches, uh, the anxiety, all the those things. The feeling of doom. The inability to sleep, it's like being on too many diet pills or too much cocaine. I don't, I mean, I just, I have never done that, but I have heard from people who have done that, mm -hmm. that that's the same feeling. And it's the same substance, basically, okay. only his body's making it. All right. So he had to have something to protect his body because the big danger in this, in this problem is that when they put him to sleep and they take this mass out, all of a sudden, his body's been running on this. It's adjusted to all this epinephrine, and then you crash. Your blood pressure crashes. Your pulse crashes. Everything crashes in surgery, which is not a good time to crash, and, and that puts you at risk of dying on the table. So you build up a resistance to the invasion. Right. And your body resets to a higher zero. It keeps zero, trying to reset until And then it crashes it back to or below regular zero. When that comes out. Okay. It's kind of like when we take the placenta out and all the hormones drop and people get postpartum depression. They're used to those hormones and then they're they're without anything. Yeah, it's like sensory adaptation. You adapt to a higher level of stimulation and then when uh -huh. they remove that, uh -huh. you crash. Right. So there's a risk of actually dying from the surgery, which right. is a pretty substantial risk. Right. So they put you on this medicine that's $16,000 yes. for a 10-day supply. So I went on. You down. I went on Good RX, which is something everyone ha should have on their phone. And I looked for Tony for, for my for my patient. I said, L let, let me look and see what this costs. So, so, so Good RX is an app that you can download for free, mm -hmm. and you put in whatever drug you're looking for, mm -hmm. and it will come up and show you all the pharmacies in your immediate area. 
if they sell it, what they sell it for. So you can find the one that will give you the best price. And they'll give, give you, you a coupon mm-hmm. so that you can take to the store and you say, I've got GoodRx on my phone. And they'll say, okay. So they drop down the price of the drug. Right, which is, I, I think, an amazing service to people because all these drugs are so overpriced. I yeah. mean, I can't believe that this right. was that much. In any case, he he, he then... Looked at it, it was six thousand dollars instead of sixteen. It was six. Still too much money for him, and too much money for, that anybody should really pay for that for ten days. So he, uh, so I said, call the doctor and tell him it's so expensive you you, sh- you can't afford it. So he did, and this nice guy called him in something else. It was ten dollars, ten dollars, and so he called him in the opposite. He had no idea it was so expensive. Well, the disease is so rare. I, right. If you get an example of it, you're not carrying around in your head all the different combinations of drugs. You look in your data. Right. You look in. Uh, you use apps on your phone yeah. that give you information Hippocrates. about drugs. And, Hippocrates is my favorite. And and anybody can download that as well. But do you have to be a physician or a medical uh, specialist to get into the higher levels of mm-hmm. it? Uh, and so you look it up and say, well, this is a primary drug. That's right. This is a go-to drug. Right. And you don't even look at the price. You say, this is what you got to have. It, it does. Because we got to get the surgery in 10 days' time. Right. So we need to get this going, right? Right. So, so, we, so he got the second drug, and it made him feel just like I thought it was going to make him feel, really tired. And, and at some point, I can't tell a patient it's going to make him feel so bad because they already feel so bad. You know, it's just they, they just have to experience it but kind of he, like you get, get worse before you get better right so you know he's counting that he counts the days to surgery and we haven't gotten to surgery yet but we i also called another friend who had who's a surgeon so i said who's the best at doing adrenal surgery and so he gave me the best and so i i, I called that office too which you know if this happened every day to all my patients i wouldn't have time to see patients if i did this but i called his office and i made sure that we could get this patient in and why and what it, what did he need to bring with him and you know and so then i talked to him and said you need you need to have your dvd or dvd you need to have your cd of your of your mri and all your records with you to bring to the surgeon so he can decide how to do the surgery and examine you and know where it is and how big it is and that's what surgeons need to know so that's the next step but right. that's the step that will cure him so this is this is basically it's it's a dangerous surgery if you don't prep right, but the surgery itself is is ninety percent curative, so that's really important. So right. then all of this stuff that's been bothering him, and I think it's been bothering him more than a year, a little at a time, because he was noticing his muscles were going down, but his testosterone was wasn't decreasing right. a year ago. So you said it's ninety percent curative. Sometimes. Because it's a very rare illness. This surgery is the cure. It is. And doesn't reoccur mm-hmm. 90% of the time. Right. The other 10%, does it occur on the other adrenal gland, or do we know that? It can. It can occur on the adrenal, on the same adrenal, or it can occur, it can occur along the nerves along your back, down your spine, the ganglion. And, and do we know, is it... Genetically inherited? Or do yes, you get it from something? It's genetically inherited. So the okay. family, family above and below need to know that this is inherited. It's a risk in the family. Right. And he doesn't have children. So brothers, sisters, cousins should know and parents should know. So those are, you know, any living, direct living relative. So yeah. this is one of those things that when, you know, I could think of nothing else really. Yeah. But this. Because you were on the trail. For, you, were, you had a mystery. You were trying to solve it. Yeah. And, and at first, I mean, I just didn't. And it was somebody you cared about. Well, and, and I'll tell yeah, I mean, this is a guy that I, I've known for years, and I don't want anything to happen to him. Sure. And I don't want anything to happen to any of my patients. I want them to be healthy and live a long life. That's what we do. Right. So for me, figuring this out wasn't quite as easy as I just described it. It was more of a, I gave up at one point and said, I, I, I have to. You know, I I always have to go back to getting on my knees and asking for help. So I did that, and the next morning I had the diagnosis. And then I knew what test to draw. So I realized that that sounds out of not normal, but that's how I get there sometimes when it's really impossible for me to think it through. And so I talked to a couple of doctors, and they looked at me, and they go, how did you figure that out? See, it's not that easy to figure it out, and I'm not going to take credit for it. Yeah. But it's, it's one of those things that 
if you do have this, if you have, I think the biggest symptoms that would that would drive me to think this was a disease I had was a, a, a fast onset high blood pressure that can't be treated. I mean, I tried- Didn't respond to traditional blood right, pressure Right, I medicines. gave them two different blood pressure medis right. medicines that they didn't work. So when I thought about this, maybe a pro possibility, I gave them a beta blocker, which is something that helps block the receptors so that you drop your blood pressure and your pulse. That worked kind of, but he still had headaches and he, st he still wasn't better. So it was clear that that wasn't working. So headaches and, and high blood pressure, looking pale mm. and losing muscle mass and fat. And sweating. Sweating. And he's had a sweating problem almost his whole life. Yeah. So you wonder whether there's something else going on with his adrenal. So, so of course, I butted in and said, why don't you ask the surgeon to just biopsy your adrenal to make sure there's not something else there? Yeah. So we'll see. The other the other diagnosis that could possibly be is uh, um, adrenal hyperplasia. So we'll be talking about that on our next HealthCast. So please join us, and we'll give you the other part of the story. As always, thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.